Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jenny Heyman, and I am a program manager for eCampus Ontario in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, and I work for David Porter um, on things open and online technology enabled for all of the universities and colleges in Ontario. Um, I'm also a very proud member of the GoGN network, so I'm a, a graduate student, a doctor student, uh, doctor of education at Arizona State University working on open research. Um, and I'm also part of a team uh, that is focusing on 101 open stories to celebrate the year of open in partnership with OE Consortium. And today's session is part two this week of open storytelling and um, welcome to all of you as guest storytellers. And the first thing we'd like to do is do some short introductions uh, for everyone and then we will get into storytelling. So Maha uh, Ab. Delmoneum, and I hope I'm saying your name right. <laughs> close to approximate. Uh, we'll start with you and uh, just please introduce yourself and then we'll get rolling along. Okay, thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon to everybody who's listening. Um, my name is Maham Delmoneum, I'm Egyptian. Um, if I introduce myself, well, the fancy title would be um, a, um, a consultant. Uh, a corporate con uh, consultant in the field of uh, learning and development and performance management. But um, the easier way of saying it is that I'm a trainer, coach. Um, that's it. <laughs> All right, great. Welcome, uh, Mahabi. I'm Mahabeli. I'm Egyptian too. Uh, I work at the American University in Cairo at the Center for Learning and Teaching, where I'm an associate professor of practice, which is a faculty developer who isn't tenure track, but is a faculty member. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm a mom, and I think it defines a lot of uh, why I'm open and, and the story that's going to come in the future. Um, one of those things is the, the co-founder and co-director of Virtually Connecting, which is one of the open things that I do, which I'll talk about later. Great. Thank you. And Catherine? Hi, everyone, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, delighted to join you all today. I watched the first in this series of talks yesterday with Anne and Bea and Martin yesterday, and it was, it was delightful to hear people's stories. So just really happy to be here. I'm physically in Galway on the west coast of Ireland, and I am an open educator and open education researcher, and more about that later. Excellent. And Sukena? Hi everyone, uh, great to be here. Um, so, um, my name is Sukaina Walji and I'm based at the Centre for Innovation and Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. And um, I have two main jobs here, uh, two projects that I work on. One is the um, Research on Open Educational Resources for Development Project, or known as Rule for D, and I'm the Research Communications Advisor. And my second role is I'm the project manager of the university's MOOC team, Massive Open Online Courses. So I sort of dabble in different forms of um, open that are often conflicting. So I'll talk about that a bit more as well. Thanks. Great. Welcome to all of you. And thank you so much for agreeing to share your stories with, uh, with me and with the open community once we um, transcribe and post our recording today. Um, so Maha A, maybe we'll start with you with, and hear more about your story. Um, okay, when I when I was invited, first of all, I'm honored to be invited with um, with you um, and to be thought of as an open uh, woman. Um, when I started thinking about it, uh, I had uh, three things came to mind. When did I uh, first uh, heard the term? open education or open in general. Uh, the second thing um, is um, what do I, what does it mean to me? And the third is when did it all start? So in, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. <laughs> um, I think it was out of um, curiosity about what the online can offer. I'd been using the internet for a while, uh, trying to practice uh, languages. I love languages, learning languages and teaching languages uh, as a hobby, not just uh, not as an educator. As, as I explained, I'm not a teacher, I'm a trainer. Um, um, so online, uh, and, uh, while searching online for uh, new ways of, uh, of uh, 
of using uh, the internet for learning and for helping others learn, I discovered um, the Wiki Educator. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, there are a group of people who've created uh, uh, Wiki Educator. They are a group of educators from around the world, and that was incredible seeing how how diverse they were. Um, and that's where I heard the term for the first time, uh, because they they were involved in different things that they called open. Uh, in the uh, wiki itself, they were just focused on creating material that was uh, that was open uh, to to be used by any educator um, in, around the world or learners for, the ma for that matter. Um, what it means to me now it's, is, again, I think it's evolved. Uh, I don't think that it's one thing. Open is, to me, as a term, is very open. <laughs> so anything that uh, allows me to think about when do, I when do I learn or the learners, when do they learn uh, and um, uh, how do they learn? Uh, how do they finish? How do they complete? How do they? Uh, how do they get uh, credit for it? How do any? Uh, who? Who teach? Who? Who? Um, uh, or through which organization and so on? Open is everything. That everything to do with learning to be open. That's how I see it. And the the funny thing is that when I keep thinking about where did I get or how did I get here? And um, how, does it how does that affect what I'm doing now with uh, learners? Um, I think it started, or it's um, influenced by me as a learner. I think open for me is not as an educator, but open for me is always, or it's uh, it always um, is about me as a learner. I always, uh, I always wanted more when I was, uh, especially in high school. I wanted to learn when I wanted to. I wanted to um, to be able to stop and start when I wa whenever I wanted. Um, I wanted to be able to s choose the subjects that I wanted, and our system didn't allow for that. Um, uh, so, I think that is uh, um, taking that forward to the present. I try to. For example, um, use virtual worlds. I've been uh, experimenting with uh, virtual worlds to do uh, uh, language teaching or language training, uh, coaching um, for people whenever they wanted, whenever they wanted, and whenever whenever they need it. Uh, not necessarily. Um, for a degree or for certificate, because I don't uh, offer that, uh, but for the sake of learning. And I started um, in 2009, I, I discovered the uh, virtual worlds. So I started experimenting with that. Um, then I got in, uh, connected to educators through a MOOC. That again, I mean, many, many things that I discovered, I discovered through, because I was curious and through virtual worlds, because there was a very big community, or at least a, a, a good sized community of educators who were also experimenting with so many things. So I discovered MOOCs through them. And the first MOOC that I attended was in 2011, uh, immediately um, after that I discovered, uh, I attended, or at least I uh, lurked in Change One, uh, Change Eleven, uh, which was uh, another um, MOOC, um, then I realized that I'd like to be able to give back, and that has to do with also perhaps a little bit of uh, religious reasons, um, because I feel that if I if I have knowledge and skills and I hoard it to myself or I only give it away if I'm paid, it's, I feel bad. <laughs> I feel in a way <clears throat> that I'm not giving the community or I'm not helping people around me. Um, but also because I'm passionate. I, I teach and I, um, I am involved, for example, in teaching English. Um, and uh, um, I run some courses, some human resource development courses uh, for NGOs in, 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 um, in my community um, because I'm passionate about the subjects because I want people to enjoy them the same way that I enjoyed them. 
um, uh, because I learned from other open educators, uh, well, open human beings, open colleagues. Uh, I have a colleague who's a, who's a British gentleman uh, who's also a friend. Uh, from day one, I had to just ask him to a question, and he would sit and discuss the subject with me. Uh, then all of a sudden, he'd say, oh, just one second. And he would go to a cabinet behind him and pull a book or a video or two and give me those and say, take a look at this. And he opened doors for me by just being interested, caring about my passion uh, uh, for learning or curiosity for learning. Um, I've from and I had I was very very lucky to have several people in my life like Peter. His name is Peter Apes. If he's if he's ever going to uh, have the chance to come across this video, um, I had the I had a I was I was very lucky to have several people like that in my life. So I feel. Uh, that open means that I give myself and others opportunity to, to learn the way that we know how, uh, when we can. For example, I, I mean, I'm not a very short, uh, I'll make it short. I tried to do a master's degree in education. And at the time I was uh, working very hard and I was covering in training about 13 countries. Uh, so I was struggling all the time. I could never finish the courses. I start well, I get very excellent feedback, and then I drop out at the, the second half or uh, after three quarters of the course. And the worst thing that happened to me is that, that the university that I was doing the course with online, when I tried to re-register again, they said, you never finished. We cannot take you back. And I thought, but I was learning. I, was, <laughs> I applied a lot of things that I learned in my job, on my job, I help other learners with what I learned from you. You opened doors for me so that I learned online from, from the readings. Why don't you accept me as a regular uh, student? And that was um, a, a lesson and, uh, and uh, created a wish for me, uh, a dream that in my lifetime, I see education more open, allowing people to study and learn when they can and the way that they can. Um, for example, for in Coursera and edX and all those uh, platforms, there are some, um, well, some people love them, some people not so much, but I actually, feel that they're doing a lot of good. In my opinion, for example, that the, the, when I uh, attend the course and I, and I can't continue it, and then I start where I ended or where I, where I left off, is a brilliant thing. The, the fact that they are free and so on. So that's what I'm doing now. And this, these are the influences that I have had in my mind. People, um, uh, the fact that I'm always thinking as a learner, not just as a teacher or educator, um, and people in my life who I learned from, who are very generous. Wow, wow, that's <laughs> an amazing story. <laughs> I really love that story so much for every reason. Um, not least that uh, you know, formal education can be so constraining and so rule bound that it's there's nothing joyful about it. Um, that happens a lot to a lot of people, which is really sad. Um, and I love that you're you know persistent in being an educator, and most certainly you are an educator. You know, formal, not formal, doesn't matter. And passionate and a learner. You know, and I love that you're focusing on learners that come to learning in any way that that is meaningful for them uh and 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 you know in whatever long or short-term amount of learning that is for them you know super passionate um i think i'm, I'm gonna move on to mahavi just to make sure that we stay on time thank you so much that was a really great story uh, maha i identify so much with with like there's a lot that you said that i identify with this one of the main things i identify with is the learner thing and I think open education allows us to keep being learners in ways that if we weren't like this, the opportunities would be much smaller. 
uh, and a lot of what I'm going to say is more about my learning than my, my teaching. Um, <laughs> and, and the other thing I really identify with is the social aspect of it. It's about the people that we get to know from both. And even though part of my story is not about people, but a lot of it is. Um, I'm just going to start with something I mentioned on my blog, which is a, a children's book that Teresa McKinnon shared with me for my daughter. She shared with me the audio, so I haven't read the book. I've just heard Teresa um, narrate it. And it's called Mabel's Magical Garden. I think what happens is that she finds, she, she grows flowers or something, which I pro they're probably not really, they're probably, um, what are they called, rhizomes or something. But anyway, she grows flowers and she finds other people have grown her flowers and she thinks that they've stolen her flowers and they tell her her they haven't. So what she does is that she builds a wall around her flowers. And what happens when she builds the wall, of course, is that the sunlight can't get through. And so her flowers don't get better no matter what she does. And she learns eventually that the flowers are actually just, um, I don't know, fly, you know, their seeds fly and they, they don't need, uh, you know, they're, nobody really stole it from her. They were just growing naturally. But the, the story about that wall is really interesting because I think in a lot of ways, when we build walls around ourselves, we stop ourselves from seeing outside, we stop other people from seeing inside, and then whatever we're, oh, am I breaking up for everyone? Okay. No, you sound nice and clear, Maha. Okay. Sometimes the Egypt Egypt connection does that. Uh, okay. We discovered that a while ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and well, speaking, of what I was going to say is that even though sometimes we break certain walls, other walls are there that are invisible or that we didn't intentionally put up there. So when we say we've broken down a wall, kind of like we're right here breaking down a wall. But even though we're both in Egypt, Maha and I can connect, but the connection isn't that great between us, <laughs> for example. Or we break down walls in academia, but there are actually borders in the countries and it's difficult for some of us to go to one place and not another. So the, well, the, just the thing that I want to say is that open is, not, is never perfectly open. Uh, and even things that are open invitations don't necessarily always invite people to join in. But I'll then, I'll now backtrack to the very beginning of what I wanted to say. Um, I do think uh, my definition of open is pretty open as well and incorporates a lot of things and a lot of them are not online. So even though online allows a lot more open, there's open where you can just share things with colleagues without necessarily uh, having to do that uh, on the open internet. Uh, and and just, just that attitude of being open is, is one thing in and of itself. Uh, but the first time I started to get to become aware of open as, the, as a term in the way that we usually mean it over here uh, was while I was working on my PhD. I did my master's fully online. Um, and even though there were the formal spaces of, of the course, we all found ways to communicate with each other outside. And this was way back at the time of dialogue, so this was 2003. And when I was doing on my PhD, I did it remotely at the University of Sheffield. So I'd go to the UK every now and then, but I was mostly not there. And there was no, I was doing my PhD in education, there was no school of education in my institution. There were very few people around me who had PhDs in social sciences from the UK. Um, and I, maybe Catherine will identify with this, but the way um, Americans approach social science PhDs is, is often quite different, especially education. Than, uh, and, and I'm at an American university, so most people who are around me had that kind of degree, or they had a British degree in sciences. So they, I didn't really have a community of people the way I assume people who are on site for a PhD get, but maybe not all people do that. But I think GoGN does that for some of you guys distributed all over the world. Um, so I had that, you know, I had just my supervisor and just the internet to communicate with him. And of course, uh, he wasn't as into the internet as I was. And what happened was that near the end of my PhD, I discovered Twitter and I discovered certain hashtags that I could use to communicate with other PhD students from all over the world. And that really helped me a lot uh, during the end of my PhD. I learned just about how to prepare for my Viva, I learned all sorts of little things that really, really helped in the end. Um, and I, there was also a phase, and, and Maha might remember this because this was 2013, in Egypt where there was political upheaval and my institution's library was closed. And um, I, had, I had a child, I was still on maternity leave. I couldn't go to a distant library, but the library was closed anyway. And there were certain books that I needed, like the, I don't know, the handbook of social science research, things that were like reference that you couldn't, take out of the book. You had to be in the library to get, and I couldn't stay that long. And what actually saved me is people who had illegal copies of things online. And even though that's not officially what we call open, I think the attitude behind it <laughs> is open. Um, and, and there were also people who, who, who used, you know, green open access routes where articles were made available online outside of the, the space where, of the journal itself. And I, there were like 10 days of my life where I could not have gotten work done if, if people had not done that. 
for me. And so that's where I fell in love with open access and that's how I fell in love with social media for openness. Um, and what, what started happening to me was that I realized that one of my issues at work was that I had a pretty a critical approach to educational technology and a radical perspective on pedagogy that people around me did not share. And that I had, you know, I could either talk to myself all the time and feel like nobody understood me and just keep going around in the loop. Or I could use the internet to meet other people who, I, who could advance the way I think and challenge me, but challenge me while understanding me um, and give me other ideas. And, and it's sort of, um, I don't think I could survive without what I have now online. And I think a lot of us who are online uh, are on the radical end of, or, this is, or on a dissenting end or, or on some end of something where there, we don't have that in our face-to-face -face enough. Um, and, and that, that was where I was coming from. And, and MOOCs like e-learning digital cultures, MOOC from Edinburgh and RISO 14 really helped me build community and get to know people who were doing this. And then after a while, it stopped being about the MOOCs. Um, and it started just being that I built this, this, these networks and those communities and, and have those personal relationships with people that aren't necessarily open, they're private, but I got to know them from the openness in the first place. Um, and then after a while, I think it was sort of what Mahas talking about talked about as well, which is the giving back part. Is that you feel like you're learning from people who are sharing, and you start to share back, and it helps when you come in with an attitude where you're not very protective of your work. But I also understand why some people would be protective of their work. So I, you know, I have this struggle where I understand why some of my colleagues aren't like that, but at the same time, that's just not the way I am, and I have the privilege to be like this. It's, it doesn't hurt me when I do this. Um, and so one of the, one of the ways, um, one of the things I think about is that openness, yes, it fills a need and it helps amplify us and it helps us build relationships, but at the same time, it's also about equity uh, and who has access to what. Um, and virtually connecting when, when Rebecca and I co-founded it was a way for me who can't travel very often, which is partly why I did my master's online, which is why I did my PhD remotely. <laughs> even before I had a child, just because culturally it's more difficult to, to do that kind of thing. Uh, but now that I did have a child, it was very difficult for me to travel to conferences very often. And because I was very well connected, it felt like I was missing out on a lot more than I used to feel like I was missing out on like 10 years ago when I went to conferences. And so virtually connecting was sort of this idea of, well, let me talk to people at conferences even though I can't be there because I'm not missing out on the talks so much because I read their blogs and I know what they're working on anyway, but I want to talk to them and I want to hear about the buzz of the conference and what kind of conversations are happening. Um, but when, when Rebecca and I originally thought about it, it was like, oh, Maha, Rebecca was like, Maha, I'll bring you into the conference. And then we're like, wait a minute, why don't we just open it up to other people too? So it could have been just between Rebecca and me and never actually grow beyond that, but we opened it up and, and then it started growing beyond that uh, and to, and it stopped being about me and meeting the people that I want to meet or my friends. It started to be, how can anyone who's at a conference who's willing to talk to people who aren't at a conference and how could you get more people to, to do this and, and benefit from it and build community while doing it, but also just you know, challenge the, the way conferences have a lot of privilege that are closed in a lot of ways to a lot of people for travel, health, financial reasons. Um, and I don't want to talk for too long, um, but just to say that in, in any kinds of, of open things, I'm always questioning um, who cannot do what we're doing still. Like just making it open doesn't mean that everyone is involved. It doesn't mean that anyone has access to it still. And uh, there are sometimes political reasons why things won't happen. And there are sometimes all kinds of reasons. And a lot of, sometimes the reasons are outside of our hands. Um, but sometimes there's something we can do about it. So that's me for now. All right, great. Thank you so much. Maha. Um, do any of the others have uh, any questions or any ideas uh, about what Ma is saying? I just I'm 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 struck a little bit Ma about the because there's a, a current kind of wave going through the community about the Open Ed Conference in Anaheim. Um, which presents, you know, several challenges for people traveling to the U.S. possibly, and um, um, you know, a potential movement to have an, a 
online, a fully online conference in open education, which, you know, what do you think are the possibilities there? There's actually another thing going on on Twitter about what online conferences can be and, and how they can, uh, Catherine, I think, was involved in that conversation. A lot of times people, when they think about moving a conference online, I think Maha's probably done a lot of online conferences in different formats as well, so maybe she mm -hmm. ought to um, but there's a lot of conferences when they, they think about moving online, they still focus on just making the presentations available online. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just a very small part of what a conference is for people. Conferences are about building social and cultural capital, they're about networking, they're about building relationships and, and human communication. Um, and I think a lot of the ways conferences get done online don't do that. Um, and virtually connecting doesn't fill everything, it just fills one gap of that. Uh, but I think, I know Maha has done conferences in virtual worlds, and I don't know how those work out. So maybe they're different. They're, um, in my opinion, I mean, I'm biased. I love <laughs> virtual worlds. But uh, yeah, they, they work more like the face-to-face -face, uh, um, conferences. You meet people after the session. You can go uh, uh, away and have a conversation, or you agree to meet even over coffee virtual coffee or whatever it is and have a party afterwards and so on so it's it's much more uh like a face-to-face -face. Uh, with the conveniences of course that uh, um that is free that you don't have to commute that you can do it while sitting in the bed uh, in bed <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right wonderful excellent so um maybe we'll move on to catherine and hear some of your story Sure, thank you so much. Um, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to follow two wonderful women like Maha A and Maha B. And there are some threads in your stories, as different as they are, that I relate to. And um, probably the biggest one is that notion of just being so passionate about openness, but also being critical about what it is and what it can be. So, um, so yeah, but lots of food for thought. Uh, another uh, similarity is I often think of my own journey as, you know, all these sparkling pieces, things that we did at particular points in time that sometimes don't make sense um, until you look at them in, in retrospect. So when Jenny asked us to think about our, our journey to how we got to be, um, you know, the open women that we are, um, I, I found that really interesting because my background is... In engineering, I did a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in engineering and worked in systems engineering for a few years. And then I changed tech completely and did uh, an MA in women's studies. And, you know, why did I do that? Well, uh, one of the reasons was that I realized that a lot of the things that I loved thinking about and talking about, like um, literature and history and politics, um, I had not studied. Um, you know, there's not a lot of room for those things in an engineering curriculum, sadly. Um, uh, but the other thing was also my experience as a woman in um, the masculine culture of engineering, as it was then and as, as it still is. So um, doing, that, um, doing that degree really changed so many things for me. And I was able to do my dissertation in gender and technology. And it was my first introduction to things like philosophy of education, to Freire, to critical pedagogy, feminist pedagogy, and, and so many things that, that have uh, carried on through my work. Um, and then throughout the 1990s, I suppose, that was in the early 1990s, throughout the 1990s, that was one of those periods in my life, which I'm sure we all have, where everything is happening all at the same time. So I lived in, in that decade, I lived in three different countries, I had my two babies, uh, I did all kinds of different work, community work and academic work. Um, but it was also the first time that I did work in, uh, officially in, we'll say, open education because I was a tutor for six years in Scotland with the Open University in Scotland and I was a tutor for uh, women's studies and a course uh, which you know when, when Martin and Bea were talking about the OU yesterday I made links to this this course called DT200 which was about the social and technical um, issues in IT as it was called and it used the cozy um, virtual conferencing system is one of the first courses to use that as far as I remember and that was very exciting there were lots of hiccups and um, but we really felt like we were you know we were we were breaking new ground um, and you know really enjoyed that um, moving on to the early 2000s I was um, back in Ireland where I have been since that time uh, despite the fact that as some of you can probably tell from my accent I'm born in New York 
Um, I became the coordinator of a distance learning program, so open, still defined really as open access, um, increasing access for, for students and perhaps students who previously would not be able to, to study in higher education. But also my practice became increasingly open um, at that time. So, so two really significant things that happened then were uh, in 2009, I started using Twitter. So again, some, some of the threads that have been mentioned in the other open stories here about that opening um, and, and early academic Twitter of, of really connecting um, with many other educators and crossing boundaries, not just of geography, which was important for me, uh, being on the west coast of Ireland, but for crossing boundaries of institution and also sector. So, you know, one small example, I remember reading an article in 2010 by Alan November about a primary school teacher in Washington, D.C. that um, was working with his students to do what they called building legacy with Wikipedia. And they were mapping their neighborhood and writing articles about um, their, the history of their local area, like the Shiloh Baptist Church, for example. So that was in 2010, and I remember just had been thinking about things like that, but I immediately that emboldened me, and I took that idea and had my students you know, writing and editing Wikipedia articles, my undergraduate IT students. So over that period of time, I certainly felt that openness changed my practice and my identity as a learner um, and as a teacher. So it didn't only change my teaching, which was probably the most visible thing, but it changed how I conceived of my role as a teacher. Um, and that's probably been the most powerful thing. And I said there were two things that really changed at that time. The first was using Twitter, and the second was, I think it's in 2010, I started blogging, following the great example of lots of early bloggers at that time. And that was because the penny dropped, and I realized that you know, I was being inspired and emboldened by educators who were sharing their practice, not just their materials, but their practice and their thinking. Um, so that notion of the commons, uh, I really began to understand was that 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 is how this works. You know that we learn, we learn by what others share, and then we have the obligation then to share share our work as well, whether it's finished and polished or in in process or or whatever it might be. Um, my frustration in those years, I suppose, was as joyful and exciting as as those open growing open practices were for me personally there was a lot of frustration around you know my role within an institution because i felt that there wasn't you know any institutional level commitment to openness you know despite various invitations to consider <laughs> such you know such changes in positions so uh, you know i moved more into the area of um, open education research so and i suppose that happened because like many of us you know if we are open practitioners we're invited to share our practice with peers and students and so on. So I found myself speaking quite often about um, others' work and my own personal practice, what, what I was doing and what my students were doing. Um, but I've really felt in the desire to want to do a piece of substantive research around some of the issues that I felt were really important in openness. So those were things like um, complexity and how um, openness is different for different people depending on their history, their context, um, their goals, and so on. And, and I felt that it was important to have a balanced approach to openness. So, you know, I saw a, a bit of what I would call evangelical uh, approaches to openness, you know, like this is, this is wonderful, it will save the world. You know, I didn't, I didn't fit into that group, but nor was I someone who dismissed it. I still feel really committed um, to openness in terms of reducing inequality. Uh, to education and also in general. So now I'm in the final year of, um, of doing my PhD in open education. I started doing that part-time uh, and working at the same time and I found that that was just too much. So I, um, I, I'm, I'm at the nearing the end of my third year of full-time and I hope to submit my thesis at the end of this year. And the core of that is that I decided to study open educational practices, you know, kind of beyond just looking at resources, um, I felt it was important to explore the perspectives not just of open educators, but of educators who might have considered openness and stepped back from that threshold for whatever reason. So, you know, I've actually 
um, explored the perspectives and stories of a lot of a lot of educators across that whole spectrum, we'll say, of closed to open, and it's been it's been really fascinating. Um, you know, and and kind of my one line summary really of the work is that open educational practices are complex. They're always personal. Um, they're contextual, of course, and they're continually negotiated. So there's no such thing as someone, as we all know, who um, just becomes open. Uh, openness is negotiated in everything we do all the time because the context changes, we change, um, what we're invited to do changes. So I think, um, you know, despite all the complexities and the, the, the huge problems that we're dealing with at the moment about, you know, practicing openness in an increasingly surveilled um, culture in, in the context of institutions, um, which present many of their own challenges to us. You know, I think openness is like a lot of other social movements, like um, civil rights and uh, you know, all kinds of human rights, women's rights, gay rights, in that at the time, progress can seem very erratic and often frustrating. And those of us who are involved might be committed to different particular aims or different ways of achieving those aims, but where the overall goal is um, reducing inequality um, and enhancing opportunities for everyone. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still deeply committed to, um, to openness and to the movement. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure what 2018 looks, for me, looks like for me yet, but, um, but I know I'll be doing a lot of the same work in some way. I suppose that's it. Great, Catherine, thank you. What a great, you know, I love all these stories so much. Um, one of the words that you used um, really resonated with me as well, um, emboldened. Mm. And so I feel that so much in, in my work in the open community and actually in, in kind of a very bold step that I took. Um, at the time I was exposed to social media and a lot of what was flying around social media was entrepreneurship and you don't need anyone's permission. And this really resonated with me because I have, a, you know, I'm a lifelong introvert. Uh, I was a nerd in school. I was a bookworm. I, my face was in a book the entire time I was school, in school. Um, so I have not had a tremendous amount of self-confidence just based on a, a multitude of things. Um, and finally found in this community um, the power to say, I don't need anyone's permission to do this. I can walk away from my formal higher education job and try this insane thing, starting my own you know, Canadian MOOC research group, um, thinking that I could do it. It didn't turn out perfectly for me and I couldn't actually do it. Um, but the failing and the trying and the learning in that is so empowering. So I just find in this community, and I find particularly among women in this community, uh, a great sense of empowerment in terms of, uh, you know, having a, being able to have a voice, being able to learn, being able, um, being heard, which is also so empowering. So I'm loving to hear all your stories. That's beautiful, Jenny. I couldn't add anything to that. That's wonderful. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Well, maybe we'll go on to Sukena and then uh, we might have a little time to talk amongst each other with questions. Hi, um, so uh, it's a great honor to be amongst all of you and I do have a bit of imposter syndrome coming in, but I'm going to continue anyway. Um, it was really interesting for me to reflect um, on the open journey. How, how do, do you get to where you are? And often it's fairly accidental. So actually just trying to think back to when I was first exposed to openness. So my background is in publishing and communications. Um, so I've come into education relatively late. Um, and re I, I moved from uh, the UK um, about 13 years ago to South Africa. And I'd been working in communications and marketing and government. And I, well, I moved here, I had a baby and a three year old. So I took some time out. Um, and it gave me some time to think about what I wanted to do. Um, and I wanted to continue the kind of communications, but I, I had moved into digital communications and I thought I really want to spend the rest of my career getting people to click on things so that you can sell them something, which was really where I felt digital marketing was going. And I almost accidentally fell into a kind of um, online tutoring e-learning project. And I was so intrigued that I started to do more of it. Um, and I was 
basically moving into kind of basic and structural design and helping people edit their courses initially and then moving into more um, you know looking at how to design courses online or blended and it was all quite sporadic and accidental and I thought actually I need to formalize this in some way I need to have a base um, you know some kind of base so I um, decided to do a master's um, in online and distance education which was offered by the Open University UK fully online masters um, and so I enrolled in that um, in early 2010 um, and that was really um, transformative for me it was fully online I was um, in Cape Town South Africa I had really no idea what a fully online masters would be like and um, it was it was kind of practice what you preach really you know I thought well if you're going to be learn how to be a, you know how to teach and design for online you've got to study in that environment um, and and that was really um, very useful um, it, um, that was offered was called openness and innovation in education which was actually um, convened by Martin Weller um, of yesterday's um, and that's where I I formally came across the notion of open educational resources, OER, OEP. Um, part of that module was offered as a MOOC, um, for, as an experiment. It was the only time it was offered as a MOOC and the year after they stopped offering it as a MOOC. Um, so I had quite a lot of kind of a uh, you know, sudden immersion into OER and openness um, a, a from a theoretical perspective. Um, and then after that, um, I, I finished the master's, I graduated, and I started working at the University of Cape Town in the Centre for Innovation in Learning and Teaching. And um, that's where I kind of also um, kind of, not accidentally, less accidentally, but I kind of uh, got involved in two projects that are very different types of open. So one was is a research project, which is researching and the adoption and impact of um, open education resources and practices across many contexts in the global south. It's a large multi-country, multi-stakeholder project that is convened at the university and I'm a small part of that. And my researchers and research teams with research communications work um, and also I've been doing some research as part of one of the research studies around MOOCs and then the other project that I was in was taking my instructional design experience and becoming part of the um, newly formed um, MOOC development team at the university. There was a decision made that the university would dabble in MOOCs and I just happened to be there and I was involved in writing a position paper and a proposal and, and it was funded. Um, and so I also was I have that now um, kind of currently coming to the end of it, um, 10 MOOCs down. I've been fully involved in sort of working with academics, um, designing massive open online courses, monitoring how they go. And it's really been a quite incredible, amazing experience of which I've also been able to research and present um, the impact. So all of that has been a kind of almost a kind of overload of openness really um, uh, uh, which is a great thing and I've been so fortunate because I've been able to be part of this um, open community open education community I've been fortunate to attend some of the conferences over the past few years where I've met people and um, but I think if I think about what it means for me, um, I, I, it's a job um, in, in one, one sense where you, where you see the value of openness and you have some advocacy and some research. And, but I think um, what Maha B was saying um, earlier was around how it makes you, how it changes you as a person. So I've, I think I was previously quite a kind of shy, retiring kind of person and, then I discovered Twitter and it was quite transformative. Um, I had discovered Twitter when I went to a conference. Um, it wasn't even an open conference, an educational conference. It was a digital conference. And someone said, oh, there's the hashtag. And um, I had installed the Twitter app on my phone, but had never used it because, you know, you, you don't know what to use it for. And I think I didn't have a purpose. And suddenly someone said, oh, there's a hashtag. I put in the hashtag and suddenly the conference was going on. And then people around me were talking to each other, 
with the hashtag. And it was so, like, I was so aghast and amazed at the whole thing that it, it was kind of my, if I think about it, it was my moment of, oh my goodness, there's something here and I want to be part of it. And then I never stopped. Um, and then it got me into blogging and tweeting and I should be doing more blogging. And But um, uh, I did blog quite a lot during my master's and straight after. Um, and so it was, it was almost like you have a propensity for openness. I mean, all those things prepare you. Um, so that, that helped me move to becoming more open. And then I implement that in my work um, in terms of how I am with other people, how, you know, it's almost like you have to manage your integrity in the open as well. So you're possibly more careful and more um, mindful of the types of um, interactions and communications that you have with people. And I brought that into the communications work I do. One of the things that has been also quite interesting to me is how to talk about open with other people for whom it is not something that is very easy um, or that it's particularly palatable. And here I give the example of some of the um, academic teams that I've been working with with MOOCs. Now, we're very fortunate at the University of Cape Town that we have an institutional policy um, for um, open educational resources. Um, it, it's, it's not mandatory, but it's supportive and enabling. So we the, made a decision um, when we started the MOOCs project, we would invite and encourage the academics to release their um, materials that were produced for these courses as open educational resources. Um, and um, firstly, to, to leverage them so that they could be reusable, but also when you're talking about um, uh, the ethos of MOOCs, we were very conscious that um, it, it seemed odd to then put copyright on them. You know, they were for open use. I know that that's a con um, But um, talking to academics about why they should, um, for example, release their materials openly, it led to really some very interesting conversations. And it really made me question, actually, what am I asking people to do here? You know, should it be just openness for the sake of openness? Um, and so the, the kind of quote pushback or very, I wouldn't even call it pushback. I just, I just think very curious, important questions because sometimes people, when you're in the kind of open, you, you get bitten by the open bug, everything has to be open or, you know, you don't question it. And so I think what I've also found and learned in talking to at the coal face really of other academics is really having to, be mindful about how you communicate the possible benefits, but also to talk about some of the risks and constraints. Um, and sometimes that it's it's not um, a, a good idea if people are not comfortable with it. Um, and so, and also really getting into licensing. And what we've found, and it's one of the research um, findings of one one of the projects that I've been working on, is around how people might be want might want to be open, but there are all sorts of issues around not being comfortable with how to license and the legal issues, um, and the technical issues, and just the complexity of it. Um, and so, that's also possibly made me think that. Um, how you talk to other people about the benefits or not of open is, is really important because that's your integrity as well. And it comes down to giving people um, a purpose and for it to be a sort of dialogue around open. And that just continues. And as Catherine was saying, it is one of continuous negotiation and you almost do it implicitly, but when you have to be explicit about it, it's actually quite difficult sometimes. So actually, why should I be open? You know, what are the benefits? And you actually really have to think and say, well, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you've got a point. So now I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and hopefully that's just given you a flavor of, of where I'm coming from. Great, Sukina, thank you so much. That's, um, that's a very great perspective about open uh, uh, as well. How do others that we are in dialogue with react to it? And it's not always positive um, for good reasons. So, um, Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. We have about 10 more minutes or so. Does anyone um, in the group want to talk maybe about the idea of, of resistance or the dialogue about open and how that, how has it impacted you as an open person? I'm just gonna jump in real quick here because this came up while Catherine and Skinner were both talking. Is 
it, the thought came to me that a lot of people who are very evangelical about open are not necessarily as open on their, in their definition of what open would be. Uh, and sometimes even within the open community, there would be some aggression around, know that it does not count as open or if you do that, then you're not being open. And it's as if open, it has inherent value. And that's not true. There is nothing inherently good about open because you could be uh, a Nazi and being open about it. And that's not necessarily something, <laughs> hopefully, that we agree with. Uh, or you could be, and there's a lot of um, a lot of white male privilege and a lot of things like open source, for example, programming that keeps being touted as an ideal that we need to look up to. And that's not necessarily the same thing that fights inequality. And sometimes to fight inequality, you choose for certain things to not be open. And that's the kind of thing about the continuous negotiation that um, Catherine talks about. And it's, and it's contextual, so it's not going to be this is the case for everyone. Uh, but yes, close it for everyone. No, maybe close it in that context, but it doesn't mean you have to close it everywhere. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. Yeah, who's Nicola saying open is not all unicorns and rainbows? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. In fact, this is coming up in Canada. Uh, around open textbooks and around our First Nations Indigenous people uh, for whom uh, much of what they do is sacred and they don't necessarily want to share it and some of what they do they would like to share but they don't want it to be changed. If I'm an Indigenous storyteller and I tell my story I actually want to um, I don't want someone to interpret my story. I want them to take my words as I express them and as my tribe and people express them. So there's some very interesting um, and important reasons not to be fully open or, or even open at all that, met, that are really important in the context, in local context. Yeah, I, I just sort of uh, follow up with something that Although I said, you know, I mentioned my story about Twitter, I've also recently become a little more, um, less open, I think, personally, on, on public forums like Twitter. Um, and that's partly because sometimes when I've, I've tweeted something around, um, and it was one particular case around one of the MOOCs, and I sort of mentioned that it was um, openly licensed, and then somebody just came in and kind of did a little attack, and well, actually, it's on the platform, so it can't be open. And it was like shut down the conversation and it was one of the you, you can't have an argument on twitter well i i find it quite difficult but i also find some of that quite um you know because then you could kind of worry about it and then you take time and so i've i perhaps cowardly in a way i've kind of drawn back a little bit and i'd rather have that kind of conversation in an environment that is more immediate like i'd be fine talking at that in a workshop or a conference presentation but sometimes when you put it out there and then you get you get a series of conversations going and you can't really engage at any nuance and i find that people are quite quick to kind of attack you um we, and, and in this case it was a particularly kind of evangelical form of open so that kind of gave me a little bit of a jolt and i'm when i advise other people now around social media i also do say that you know as a woman sometimes you're quite conscious of what you say and do um, and it's sad in a way but i think it is something that i will talk to my daughter about as well in terms of how much you 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 are willing to give away of yourself on on, on these kinds of forums mm -hmm. maha a or catherine you have anything you want to add or yeah, so much strikes me there, um, Jenny. I um, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, I think Sakina, just what you're talking about there, and and Maha as well. The the complexity that we have have come to understand around openness, and also how it changes. You know, it's different. Being an open practitioner now is different than it was, you know, in 2013, and it was in 2010. Okay, so it's always changing. Um, but that's that valuable perspective is what is, is just what we need to share with our children and our students and our peers and so on. So just that really simplistic view of open, you know, doesn't really do anybody any favors. Um, because the flip side of, of, of being frightened of open is then not having our voice. And, you know, in a culture which is increasingly, you know, open and participatory, um, we want to have as many voices as possible. So it's about you know, being cognizant of the risks, but also figuring out how and where 
um, to be open, um, you know, safely and wisely and comfortably. So yeah, just those kinds of perspectives that you are sharing, um, you know, that's just, that's, that's just the work we need to do, I think. So yeah, so valuable to hear all your stories. Maha A, I'm just curious, um, because you're working in a slightly different spectrum, um, do you get do you get pushback from colleagues, others who are working in consulting and training, or pushback from students? Um, no, as a trainer, uh, when I work with in a, in an organization, um, being open was very useful for my trainees, of course, and uh, and for my colleagues and for me. Um, so there was no pushback, to be honest. And I, again, perhaps I was just lucky. And this is what. I wanted to say that uh, listening to to all of you talking about also the part of the community, uh, the the commons, the the people who actually uh, you learn from and share with, and so on. Um, in my environment, um, it's a corporate environment. It's usually very. Um, sometimes extremely competitive, uh, especially in the Gulf. People are all, everybody's an expatriate. Everybody is in a way afraid uh, for their own jobs and so on. Um, but still, I found communities uh, uh, that shared with each other everything. Uh, they shared material. They shared experiences. They shared, and they were they came from uh, uh, organizations that. Are, were similar to mine, so I thought they would be f afraid of sharing, but they weren't. Uh, they came from uh, um, all kinds of uh, industries, and I was very lucky to find that. Also, in my in the department where I worked, uh, I was lucky to have managers and and management that. Um, um, kept things extremely open. I could work with anybody whenever I want to, as long as I don't have anything that I'm actually working on that I would, you know, like uh, affect negative, negatively if I don't focus on. Uh, so I had uh, the, the chance to work with all of my colleagues in different types of training and that's how I learned and helped others and discovered new things that uh, discovered other people's talents and discovered my own. Uh, so I think the community is very important and people who push back can be influenced net positively by just being in that environment and seeing that there's nothing to be scared of. There are, as Sukanya said, there are uh, those situations where totally open is not a good thing. <laughs> it's not, and as Maha said, it's not uh, uh, just that open uh, in general is uh, considered uh, good, but it's how it's used and why it's used. I want to respond to something Nicola wrote, and it, it builds on a little bit what Maha is talking about as well. Um, Nicola wrote in the text chat that being open is easier in supportive organizational cultures, and some sad that you know colleagues don't have that. But the point is that when you don't have that supportive organizational culture, open is maybe the only thing that saves you, that keeps you going. I mean, um, and so I, I think it takes, one of the things I was trying to explain to my boss recently is that it takes a lot of time and effort to be able to smoothly benefit from open. And I think inviting people into it, some people will take a very long time to reach that threshold at which openness is helpful for them, especially if their personality is not like yours and mine. Um, and so I know some people when they're shy, openness helps them open up, uh, but people who are extroverted and they go open, then that's just like really easy. So it's like a party, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and not everyone wants that. Uh, and for some shy people, that still isn't, that still doesn't, make them feel good, it doesn't make them feel empowered. Um, and, and it's all right, there, there, there are probably other things that make them feel good that don't make me feel good. And that's all right. Uh, the thing is, you know, and one of the things we all talked about is how it influences more as learners than as teachers. Uh, but one of the things I try to do as a teacher is also get my students into the open as much as possible. There's nothing really risky about the topic we talk about, so I don't worry about them so much. Um, but if I were, I would have to worry. But I'd just like to expose them to, I think what Maha A was talking about earlier, formal education is so structured and stifling in ways. And I just want them to realize that beyond what I'm giving you in class, there's so much else out there that you can learn from. And a lot of times when they do that, they teach me. They find things and they bring them back to the class and then I take those back to this semester and to next semester and so on. 
I think it's the, uh, just a, a final thing on my mind that I think being open or openness in general, whether it's education, because some of the examples that I gave, like the about my department, is about how to work openly, not just as an as an educator, but just as a colleague, as a as a person. And so I think it's a state of mind, and I think it is a state of mind that some people are lucky to have uh, naturally, but it is something that can people can learn to trust and become uh, or to have. All right, well, I think that's a perfect way to end our hour of storytelling. Um, yeah, open is a state of mind. <laughs> Lovely, thank you all so much for your time and your agreement to, uh, to tell your stories. I really look forward to sharing them with the rest of the community and, and hearing more stories. So uh, I have two more days this week of storytelling and uh, I'm looking forward to that. But thank you all so much uh, for your gracious time. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jenny, everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.